Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS, Sam, and I've been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. <laughs> yes, we do. We want to quickly thank our donors on DonorBox and the members of our YouTube channel. And we're super excited to announce that we finally, after years and years of requests, got a Patreon. Yes, we are excited. We have mostly just had a hard time trying to figure out, like, what kind of extra content we could give or what we could do that would be special for our patrons if we did do Patreon. And so if you head over there, we'll leave the link in our description. You can see we did come up with a couple tiers as well as like our VIP exclusives of Sam is currently writing his story into a book. Yeah. And we are going to be sharing a page a week of like the rough draft so you can kind of see his process of writing his book some of the stories coming out ahead of time so we thought that would be super fun to reveal on our patreon so we have some lives going on over there ad free videos and then that so go check that out we're excited we're so grateful for all of you who've been like yeah. do you have a patreon do you have a patreon and so we're like <laughs> we need to do this and we've got it all figured out now. We so. finally did it, and we're finally writing the book about my life. And the first, it's going to be a series probably because there's a lot to say there. But we're very excited to be doing that finally. We're excited to share it with you. Thank you all so much for your support to this point, and we really look forward to sharing that information with you as it comes out. Yes, I also had to do another quick shout out. We went to the Holding Out Help annual fundraiser last weekend. It was wonderful, amazing. I know we always keep the Holding Out Help information um, down in the description, mm -hmm. but just such an awesome organization. Got to hang out with some awesome people like Mike King, Addie McCall. If you have not seen our video with her of telling her story of what it was like for her to grow up in the AUB, you can click the link above. And shout out because look yeah. at these. Yes. cute tumblers oh. look at this look what she made us oh my gosh so cute so we finally have something with our logo and name on it thank you Addie. <laughs> Thanks, Addie. <laughs> and we just had an awesome time at that event yeah. really raising awareness and getting to tour through the holly's house and the phoenix home to see what holding out helps doing and just awesome organization if any of you want to also support them again we have that link below so. yes it's a lot of, a lot of, uh, we don't normally have as much business to get through at the beginning. It's a long intro. We're sorry, but thank you all so much for being here. We're excited to jump in today's episode that is going to be about Secrets of Polygamy episode, well, still, still season one, episode seven. Yes, this one, I mean, the title was Indoctrination, mm -hmm. but I feel like a lot more of it was about abuse of children. Which comes hand in hand with indoctrination. Yes, I guess. and then a big portion about their charter school. So mm -hmm. before we get into the school stuff, which is sticky in so many ways, right? right. But they did have Colleen on there, who we've seen on other stuff before. She so. even appeared on Sister Wives at one point. Yeah, so she we, went and we've stayed seen with her. the Browns yeah. for a couple of days. She was um, a part of Escaping Polygamy. I believe she was. She showed up in that show once in a while. Same with Matt. Matt was the security in Escaping Polygamy, yeah. or at least for some of them. So Yeah, so yeah. she came back and and was sharing more of what it was like growing up in the Kingstons, particularly about like the physical abuse and how they trap and abuse kids to get them to comply in obedience until they can yeah. get married, right? It was obviously heartbreaking. They say that their physical abuse is correction. And they said the most typical is just slapping the kids till they stop crying, which makes me, my blood boil. It's so frustrating and just... Oh. Like I, the, just that alone. I mean, we could create an entire episode on just that. Our feelings about treating kids that way. As young as two, and she was like, "Yeah, even walking into church, that it was just very typical. You'd see parents slapping their kids across the face and beating them all the time, everywhere. It was just really, really common." My first thought is that's not natural. I don't think anyone is just a, a natural instinct would say, hey, let's go slap kids. Like that doesn't seem like Yeah, how do you do that, that as would a loving be... parent? And so for parents to do that, I mean, that must be some serious indoctrination here mm -hmm. to to convince the, them that that's okay and that's what they're supposed to do. And, and of course, there's probably just some bad people doing it as well. But to, and they do it to make them stop crying. I mean, what kind of method is that? I mean, how is that going to tell someone, hey, stop crying. Let me give you some more pain so you can stop crying. It just, the whole thing just infuriates me. So it was hard to watch. Yeah. And she was talking about, I mean, obviously they just like beat them into submission, right? 
And then Colleen was talking about specifically, they prepare and are constantly telling the girls about getting married. Like it's all about just getting them to the age of marriage, 15, 16 years old, get married at 16 because that's the legal age in Utah with parental consent. She was talking about like the order dances, um, but Oh, it creeped me out so bad because he even asked, he's like, oh, is this youth dances? Because like growing up mainstream LDS, we had youth dances, that, but it was very specific to dance with kids your own age, potentially find people you'd want to go on dates with. It was never, she was like, oh no, like a 50 year old man could ask a 14 year old girl to dance yeah. and possibly be like searching for more wives. Like, oh, just the predator, predatory cycle in that, right? Yeah. That they're supposed to be praying about who they're going to marry. And then they get put in these situations around these older men who have who knows how many wives and it's not age appropriate at all. And then they get married at a young age. And Colleen was talking about the fact she ran away and she literally got kidnapped back into her family basically and taken to a repentance home, which reminded me of the FLDS, like the homes in hiding Mm -hmm. type thing where... uh, In Idaho is where she was sent. yeah, Yeah. But they have to go back and repent for what they've done. She said mostly for her at 15, it revolved around her praying about who she was supposed to marry so that then she could be contained. Lock her in a room and tell her to pray about who she's supposed to marry. And it sounds like it broke her in some way or another because she did eventually come to terms with it and ended up getting married to someone who was a lot older than her. Yeah, she was 16, he was 21. The sad thing is, after watching this many episodes, when they said he's 21, I was like, oh, good, not an old man. And then I was like, 16, 20, that's a five-year difference still, like 16 and 21. And five years isn't extreme compared to like other age gaps that we've seen. And I know the yeah, five... if they were both in their 20s, like that, 21 and 26 is a different thing. That's what I was going to say. But still, yeah. you're like legally 21 years old and marrying a 16-year-old that should be in high school. Yeah, exactly. It's not the age gap, but again, it I just like hit me that I was like relieved for her and then still realizing like that's still a big age difference of even maturity wise from when you're 16 to the time that you're 21 is yeah. just such a huge gap in maturity and even like physically, like bodily wise, right? Like right. even you're not even done growing. <laughs> yeah. Something that's bothered me, I would say geez probably probably if not my whole life at least for a lot of years uh growing up in the polygamous lifestyle and all of that something that's always bothered me is the i mean i was raised to believe that polygamy was of god so you know just going with that mentality let's say let's say god commanded polygamy to be an important thing to practice on this earth let's just say that was true because that's the way i was taught to believe as a young boy Okay, so, but why, if if it is important to have polygamy, that's one thing, but if you're going to practice polygamy, why is it important or necessary or whatever you would call it for the older man to marry the younger girls? And, and I mean, very young girls in some cases. I, I just don't, I've never understood why that was a part of it. Even when I was in the middle of it, how, why is it important for my 15 year old sister to marry this man in his 40s or my 19 year old sister to marry this man in his almost 80s like what was that purpose god god can't be commanding that right i mean that's something i've always wondered yeah and it's been from the beginning right like from the very beginning joseph smith had very young plural wives and so it just doesn't make yeah it doesn't make sense Hmm. like you said if it's necessary why couldn't it be within the same age range and I mean, that's a big if before that, <laughs> but I, agree I mean, I know you. people have their theories and or excuses, I guess you could call them. People will always have their so-called reasoning and, and the reasons why they do things the way they do things. That's something I've found because I've talked to so many people in these different groups and they always have their reasons, but at some point you can't reason yourself out of immorality. Yeah. That, and so anyway, I'm I'm sorry to go on that rant. It's just something that I've always wondered. And when this episode brought it up again uh, about the dances and that everyone would go to dance. And my first thought, probably your first thought was, yeah, oh, a youth dance, yeah, right? Same. They all go yeah. in the, yeah. But no, I mean, there would be these 15 year old, 15 year old girls and a 50 year old man could come up and ask her to dance. Something about that sentence just made me go, oh, wait a minute. You know, it kind of brought it to reality to me. And uh, maybe it's because I'm a parent now, and uh, so I think of things differently. But 
it's just hard to imagine. Yeah, it really is. And then the next major thing that this episode was about was about, in 2017, Vanguard Academy, which I had heard about this a little bit in um, 2017 when it was happening in Utah when there was these investigations. But basically, it's a charter school. So they have a charter school, and it started because somebody started investigating like the demographics of the charter schools. And West Valley is one of the most diverse cities in Utah. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why is this charter school 100% white? Like, that's weird. So they were coming, like the state was coming at it from a demographic angle of like, that doesn't make sense because that's not the demographic of that area. Why is this happening? And they were coming from a racism standpoint. And then as they're investigating, they're finding out that like the whole yearbook is Kingston's. And okay. Or a lot of it. And the yeah. contractors that are being hired by this charter school are all companies owned by Kingston's. Now, I don't know. I would have to like look into it more than just this because there were a couple of like initial thoughts where I'm like, the government's going to pay for those kids to be in public school no matter where they are, right? So it's not like the government is saving money or paying more money by them being seats in the, in the same school. Now, the demographic thing is obviously very troublesome in the sense that it should represent and should give them a broader view to the outside world, mm -hmm. right? But the idea that like, oh, the government should be paying for those kids' education, I don't agree with that because we should be paying for all children's education, right? So no matter where they are, the same amount of money is going to go to those students if they're in a regular public school. And if anything, I would hate that if that school got shut down, they all got homeschooled and were more in the abusive things rather than in a charter school hopefully that's doing better i want to know more i guess is all i'm saying yeah. because it seems so tricky now the funneling in the the money is a big problem right. right if they're using the school just to give themselves more business yeah i mean it's tricky though because the way that they were able to get away with it i guess you could say is that charter schools at least the ones i'm familiar with it's pretty common to prioritize those that are family mm -hmm. or that are you know family of the staff so if, if a lot of your staff are Kingston and a lot of the students that started there are Kingston, then it, they're, then they're going to say, oh, we're just prioritizing family. But if one family has 150 kids, <laughs> you know, then it's going to fill up pretty quickly. All the seats are going to be filled up with Kingston's. So I think they were able to kind of just make that look normal because, oh, we're just, we're just prioritizing family. But it ended up being basically one family. Yeah. <laughs> or at least uh, relatives. Yeah, or a religious community. And they didn't go into a lot of like what the curriculum looked like. That was kind of, I guess, more of my overall question was like, are they doing indoctrination within that school mm -hmm. because it's all Kingston's? Or does it just happen to be Kingston's? I mean, it seems like too big of a coincidence, right? That they wouldn't do indoctrination right. or bring religion into it but i definitely had a lot more questions than answers in like this segment alone right and because yes like we've enjoyed that like the fact that siblings get into charter schools like mm -hmm. you know our daughter's in a charter school and then our son's going into kindergarten in the fall and he did get prioritized and you know our daughter was like 117th on the wait list or something right. when we tried to get her in but now that she's in our son was you know automatically got in so in a normal circumstance, in a normal diverse community, <laughs> that works yeah, great. Where, and it's where awesome. families have two or three or four kids, you know, our school is very diverse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a, and it reflects very our community as well, right. like the demographics do. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so there's just, I don't know. I felt like there was a lot more questions. And I thought it was interesting that every time the state was coming in and trying to do something to this charter school, though, they were able to fight back legally and win. Mm-hmm. And I think they mentioned at one point, like, there's nothing illegal happening that they can see so far. It's just unethical. Right. You know, and so, again, that comes to a fine line of if it really is coincidence, and I want to know more of what their curriculum is, and if they're indoctrinating, or if they're abusing children in the school, like, shut that down, you know? Right. Or are they not, and it is running like a regular school and it just happens to be that everybody's related because they all got in. Well, uh, there were some staff members there, they mentioned, that were not Kingston. They didn't it, know that everyone was Kingston for a while. Right. And they said that one of their concerns was that these young girls would all of a sudden disappear. It's almost as though once they reach that 15, 16-year-old mark, 
they would go prepare and get married, and then that was the end of their education as soon as they got married. So that was a big concern, which they have been looking into because of that. But but the legality, and Sam and I talked about this the other day. We weren't even watching, or maybe we were watching an episode of something, I can't remember. But we were talking about the fact that the state of Utah, like what good is coming from 16-year-olds being allowed to be married even with the consent of their parents. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like it's causing a lot of room for parents to force their children to be married at 16. And I'm curious, and maybe if some of you live in Utah, like leave in the comments below of someone who was just madly fell in love at 16 and their parents were like, fine, you can get married. Like how common is that? Or are we letting the system be a system that is mostly for abuse mm. and very rarely for people who are just falling in love super young and their parents are all for it and they're like okay fine you know what i mean well like, if you're taught that you know if you're taught you're, that you're supposed to get married at that young age and you're taught your entire life that that's your most important thing in life is to get married and have children then it's going to be almost I mean, I'm just speaking for myself. I mean, as a very young boy, even as a boy, I mean, this, and it was much more extreme for the girls. I was thinking of marriage as a, as a young, young teenager. I'm like, well, I mean, got to get married and have those kids, right? <laughs> and, and that's coming from a, from a young boy. So that's, that just goes to show that in these environments, you're going to be thinking about that at a very yeah. young age and who am I supposed to be with? And so it's just going to become very normal and natural for those people. Oh, a hundred percent. I just don't know what the advantage to it being 16 instead of 18, because if someone's getting married at 16 or if they said, I don't want to get married at 16 and their parents wanted them to, they're not old enough to legally move out on their own and make a different decision for themselves. Mm. So you have these two separate ages of if they're in one of these, communities and their parents force them to get married at 16 they can't just run away and be on their own they'd have to legally get put into foster care right or go live with somebody else because they're not an adult yet so yeah. i almost wonder like yeah i don't know if they're going to be able to stop this from happening in utah without raising the legal age limit of marriage so that people can't abuse them. I know they have raised that legal age marriage in other places. So I know that it has been done to put an end to some of these kinds of things where you have to be an adult. You have to be able to make your own decisions before you can get married. And mm -hmm. that's, I mean, I've heard that people are, I don't know, you hear both sides. People are angry about that and people are super happy about that. And I guess it just depends on how you look at life and, and priorities. But Well, and it's hard when rules have to be made or laws have to be made for like people abusing power, right? right? You see that, or even when they were talking about, you know, what can be done with this school or the contracts going to other Kingston groups, right? And they're like, well, we need to like buckle down and make a law about the contracts that charter schools make. And I thought, man, there's like hundreds of charter schools in every state, right? Can you imagine a new law coming in that's gonna make all of your paperwork more difficult and more government oversight for you to be able to hire a trash man? Yeah. You know, like to be able to hire a trash company and now all of that's changing because one school in one area is abusing that power. So it's tough anytime you try to find ways to create laws to protect people and also not make everything else more difficult for the rest of people who are just living their normal lives. I have to wonder if there is a, a way to do that, like by a count for a county, right? Like target one specific county or city and kind of make that a rule for that place because of the situation instead of just saying, well, because this one school did it, now we have to make this rule mm -hmm. for everybody. I would, I would hope there's some kind of way to do that, but I'm not a government official, so I'm not sure how that works. Well, and they did successfully get the school board completely taken off and then the school board went and fought against them and won the right to get their school board back. Right. And so again, it's one of those tricky situations too where it's like if they're only being fired because they belong to a certain religious group, that goes against everything the United States stands for, right? Yeah. In the freedom of people being able to, like you shouldn't get fired because of your religion. Right. And at the same time, all of us from the outside can see the bigger picture, see the bigger problems that could be happening but trying to prove that all. So it's definitely not over. No. And Vanguard Academy is still running. So we will have to see. Maybe we'll have to keep updates on this as we hear and see more about what ends what's up going happening. On. Maybe they force some kind of leadership change of some kind or another. I don't know how. 
it's you, it's tricky though because you're right though there's there comes that i mean coming from a very religious background myself when you're in the religion and religious you know that freedom is very important to you which i know it is to most americans i would say and someone comes in and tries to make all of these adjustments because of your religious belief it's, it's frustrating. it is very very frustrating and that's why it's so it was so easy for like the FLDS, for example, to convince us that the government was against us because of any kind of change they would try to make in their eyes for the embetterment of the community. But in our eyes, it was just to tear us down, to cause problems. And so in some ways, it made it even worse because then we were trying to fight against the government in some ways. And so, yeah, it's just a, it's a hard line depending on which side of the fence you're on to understand where the other person is coming from and why they're doing what they're doing. So well, it, it's a tough one. And I still have that fear that let's say they shut it down and they said, okay, you have to bring in people, you have to prioritize people who aren't the family. And all of a sudden now the siblings aren't getting into the school. So they start taking the kids out and they're putting them into right back into homeschool mm -hmm. in abusive homes, which is better. Like obviously we all have this dream and this is what this school the analyst was saying, you know, kids should be exposed to people of all walks of life. Um, there should be diversity demographically, diversity of beliefs. Like that's part of having like a well-rounded person is being around people that aren't just like you, right? Mm -hmm. But is it better or is it like, that's the ideal. But if their choices are being in a charter school that's gonna have a regular curriculum around all other Kingstons, or being homeschooled and having no school experience mm -hmm. and being in abusive households all day 24 7 like which is the lesser of two evils right and so that's tough too i don't know if it's good to be like forcing everybody out of that because yeah now they don't have access to the public school system which is frowned upon for them to go to regular public school yeah it's a tough one. Yep. And just FYI, I know that a lot of times the stories that come out about groups and the stories that come out about different areas in life, I guess, tend to focus a lot on the negative. I just want to throw this out there for anyone that I guess is hurt by all of the negativity about the Kingston group or other groups that uh, people are talking about. Coming from the FLDS, where most everyone that talks about the FLDS, it's all negative. It's all bad. I'm sure that there are some families in the Kingston group as well that aren't abusing their children and aren't doing all of these awful things that some of the families are doing. So we're not saying that if anyone went to homeschool, they would automatically be, be being abused or something. That's, yeah. not, that's not a blanket statement, but because these types of things are happening, you have to be cautious and wonder and try to make sure that there isn't you know, that there isn't that abuse happening. Maybe not in every home, but in some of the homes. Yeah, that's a good so. good ca caveat for sure. But we will be back at it next week. There's, I know, at least three more episodes. And we'll see. I have no idea where this is going to end or how many more episodes they're going to have. But if you want to continue here, what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy or us covering more of the secrets of polygamy, then please like and subscribe. Yes. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. We look forward to talking with you soon. Talk to you all soon. Thank you.